Welcome back to Hey on Track Frankfurt, the Bundesliga podcast covering everything there is to know in the English language about Eintracht Frankfurt, the greatest club, finally, again, for the first time in a little while, Woo! I'll say, in the city of Frankfurt. It's been a difficult, difficult few weeks. We're going to take a collective breath here, if you hadn't noticed, which I'm sure you did because Spotify wasn't buzzing into your ear. We took a little bit of a collective break. Uh, it's been an exhausting uh, run the last couple months with frustration on the Frankfurt side. And, you know, I'm not going to say we only do this podcast when things are good, but it gets a little depressing putting out negative content um, for a, a club that's underperforming and underwhelming. And not that we won't do it, not that we can't do it, but, you know, if it's picking between time with the kid or talking on track, um, I'm picking time with the kid over these Bundesliga losses. That's just me personally. By the way, this is Chris here in, in Michigan. I'm all over the damn state right now. Um, but I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to have you guys listening again. Uh, we're going to get into it here in a minute. But first, ways you can get in contact with the show. Of course, um, halfpod.com. All of our links are, are there at the top of the page, hefpod.com. Uh, shout out to... Our friends over at sportmonks.com providing us the API for their statistic zone. Uh, absolutely outstanding product. And that's how I was able to follow the Frauen uh, during their recent match because guess what? Still no stream in the United States. So check out halfpod.com where you can listen to past episodes. Check out Bundesliga and Eintracht Frankfurt stats and scores. Uh, links to our Twitter feed, uh, x.com forward slash hefpod. Matt's back. Matt's doing uh, Instagram at Hey on Track Frankfurt, and Matt's getting married soon. We're really excited for him. Hope to have him back on the show really damn soon. I'm gonna get all over him about that one. But tonight, um, a man I had the pleasure of dining with last night, man, I'm gonna have a pleasure to dine with again this weekend. Garrett uh, from the Mean Streets of Warren, Michigan. How you doing, buddy? Chris, um, I am doing really good. Um, you know, you were talking about the um, taking breaks sometimes just because it's necessary. Um, you know, it's been a little bit since I've been on. And you know this because you and I have talked about it. Um, I think last month I was hitting, even really before this rough run of form that we have, I was feeling a state of discontent with, our near and dear Diadler, not so much just off of the results on the pitch, but about, you know, some other things we've talked about before um, as American, uh, North American supporters of this club and the difficulties that um, gets presented about that, even though we think it shouldn't be difficult, i.e. supporter group memberships, being able to be a member. Um, and I think I needed to take a little bit of a break and stuff when the Sir Alex Ferguson lifetime membership thing happened because I was asking questions. Sure. But when you step away for a moment, it allows you to maybe take the time that you maybe you needed to have. And something about what w the match that on Friday gave us a good feeling back and maybe. Also, for me, biased here, we're hosting the NFL draft locally. I'm watching my slightly biased opinion, the greatest baseball team in Major League Baseball. <laughs> um, and City, Detroit City being 5-0. and oh. you know, But you know what? I think that can extend to our Frankfurt, and yeah, it's a good day. You know, you're, you're talking about taking breaks and being in the right mental headspace. Um, the fact that we care so much about this club to let it affect us emotionally and, you know, to, to sometimes consume us more than it should. Uh, but to have that recognition that, Hey, uh, you know, I got to chill out a little bit. Hey, this shouldn't be affecting me as much as it is. You're passionate. You care. That's a good thing. And I was kind of hit the same way by the Sir Alex Ferguson thing. I mean, fantastic man, legend of the game and nothing at all against him. But at the same time, I want my membership. I'm pouring so much time and money into this damn club the 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 merch I'm buying, you know, the the podcast that we just brag about how wonderful this is. We want a little 
part of that too. And we're not allowed to have it right, right. now. And uh, it's a fair argument to be had. But we keep coming back week after week or, you know, after a couple of weeks off, month after month, because this club means that much to us. The passion is there and that's never going to go away. Sometimes you got to step back, keep things in perspective. And uh, it's important to do that. But you can never give it up. Uh, Eintracht is way too good for that. And they were way too good on the weekend. And that's what we're going to get into right now. Um, Hell yeah. I'm not even going to discuss what happened during during the the break because, you know, there was nothing good. It was loss after loss, uh, loss to Stuttgart, frown losing to Leverkusen, just not anything good to talk about and only the bad. So we're going to focus on the good. And that was this past weekend, uh, Friday, April 19, Eintracht Frankfurt 3, FC Augsburg 1. Um, and to be honest, uh, after a few minutes uh, into the match, things starting real well. You think, hey, guys are awake. And then Augsburg uh, gets a nice takeaway and goes in just a beautiful through ball and fantastic finish. Uh, great goal by Augsburg, but you're like, oh shit, here we go again. Um, early, you know, early, early trailing Eintracht has come about again. It's something that's becoming a concerning pattern where we have an early spell of possession, maybe in the first three to four minutes. And then for the next 20 to 30 minutes, we just kind of disappear. Uh, it wasn't as prevalent in this one, even though we allowed the goal. I thought we played pretty well. Uh, it was a little deflating allowing that goal, but certainly wasn't um, something I felt we couldn't come back from. Augsburg uh, more concerned me because we're fighting in a table position right there, and I didn't want to have to concede even more space because we were, we were precarious in that six spot, which we'll talk about a little more later. But um, Gary, your thoughts on the early part of the match? Um, you know, I would say the first, like you, I was feeling really good about the first 10 minutes. I liked the, the jump we had. Um, I liked us trying to move north to south more as much, if not a little bit more than east to west in terms of our play. But there's a reason why Augsburg are in seventh place and had they beaten us by two goals on Friday would have overtaken us for sixth place. That opening goal showed it. Um, quick transition movement, the Marovic, great ball. Vargas, that was a hell of a strike. Like kind of caught me off guard of how well he hit that from that close of a range because I don't think even Trap was like, whoa, he did that. Um, and you know what? It could have been worse, but we rode the storm out in that game. Uh, we needed one to get going. We needed a little bit of luck, and Ferris Chayibi with a strike that it looks like it's going to hit right at the keeper. The keeper, you know, he makes a good enough contact with one hand dive and saves it, but that ball had a mindset of its own, what it was going to do, and it eventually it trickles in. Yeah. It even stands up. And you know what? It like, didn't have okay. to be. It didn't have to be some blistering shot that just had eyes for the corner or, you know, it, it wasn't the highlight real goal that's going to stick around for years, like a Jovic or a right. Haller kind of finish uh, in previous years. But it was the kind of one where you felt that calming presence, like, okay, things are going to be okay. The guys are still mentally there. There was a lot of chatter early in that match um, on our Discord chat, and we were finding it on – Twitter, I may have fed it just a little bit myself, um, that this group had given up, that they're, you know, coming off the Stuttgart, just debacle where no one even really got off the bus, uh, going down early in this one felt like a defeat. And somewhere along the right. way, someone woke this group up and said, we are not going to do this, not this time. Took a little longer than expected, but Dino's halftime adjustments, whatever that is. I think that's, I think that's more of a catchphrase. I don't, you know, we, we talk a lot about tactical adjustments at the half. I, I've talked to a few coaches about that and they kind of say it's more of just kind of things that the media talks about that. There's not as many adjustments as there are guys on their own being more focused on what they have to do as individuals. Now, you know, right. shapes, changing a formation and changing lineups 
can have an effect, but that's not really Dino's style. Once we're into a match, we don't change shape. Uh, we don't do, uh, unless there's injuries, we generally don't change personnel until later on. Um, I just think these guys had enough of it and they decided they were going to take it into their own hands. And, and I really liked after, after the Chibi goal, um, they just put the foot on the gas and left it there. Uh, Ak- Akitike, I, I put it in my notes here. Uh, Phil Bonney, uh, wonderful commentator, friend of the show, probably not his best match as far as commentary. Uh, some of the comments in the first half when he said, I yeah. track loves to shoot the ball. Uh, we're the team of the fewest shots in the league, but he had, he had a great comment before the Akitike goal when he was fooling around with the ball. He said, he's got to be less for, less flowery and more direct. And then two seconds later, he kind of swings back around with the ball and takes that shot. It was so awesome to see him get on the board. We've waited so long for this. I don't know if it's enough. Or- who was it on? Go ahead. Who was it in our group? Who was it in our group that was like yelling back and forth? Pass it. No, keep going. Pass it. What? I think it was um, – one of our uh, European contingent watching with his dad. <laughs> yes, and, yes, or yes. Maybe, yeah, that's good. And it was like what, screaming at the TV, and like what, the, like essentially. And then he took that shot, and you had that feeling. The crowd had the feeling of like, all right, we're up. Ekatike had that feeling like, all right, because you know we've seen this before with like guys and like you know, you know, you and I are hockey guys. When you like somebody's on a massive goal goal streak and they keep you know they keep trying too hard because they want to get off that schneid. Ekatike, I think was like that for a bit. He needed something to get off the you know get that goal. When he did that, it was like euphoria. You know, I, I think and part of that element that you're talking about too uh, from fans of the Frankfurt side, where we've seen guys come through and have a lot of nice touches of the ball guys that come in with highlight reel, uh, you know, YouTube packages that say, Oh, this is an incredible signing. And Ekatike who doesn't have that necessarily YouTube sense of him, like, like other guys that have come through the Ackman's or Blanco's of the world, but he's, he's realizing that we're not a pretty city. We're a gritty city. And, that's, right. you know, I've used that term for my teams uh, here in Detroit because it's more, you know, appropriate for our city. But even in Frankfurt, you know, I think they're, they're realizing that it's gritty, not pretty that works with this side. And he tried the pretty. He got shut down. He came in with the gritty and just put it on target. And I really hope that opens things up for him. I'm not necessarily ready to trigger that that sales clause yet. Not off one goal, not off one quality game. But I was pleased with everything that I saw from him working off other players and obviously finding the goal himself. Uh, let's, um, I mean, we can talk a minute about the Marmouche goal, uh, 90 plus five. It, the, someone posted a side by side of that and the Kasinovich goal in the cup final against uh, Munich. Just literally identical goals, identical situations with the, the goalie up fighting. Uh, for that equalizer and then a player running off on the loan with no keeper and the sideline running down the side with him, ready to meet him at the goal. Absolutely. Um, did pandemonium. In the did Kucinovich take his shirt off like Barmush did or no? I'm trying to remember. You that. know, I think he did, but there was such a mob of people there. I think everyone was taking their shirts off. It was like a billion degrees in Berlin that day. Uh, yeah. I think everyone is ripping their shirts off or, ripping them off to put on championship shirts at that point. But. I think I agree with you. I think that Marmush goal was the seal of approval that this game should have been 3-1 because Einskar Knauf had that moment of brilliance where he broke out, like ran by everybody, but he saw the keeper running out, and instead of taking the shot to try to get it past him, he tried to do the runaround. Um, Marmush made sure he was going to get that goal to reflect the game. So I'm glad between Knopf and Marmish in those moments, somebody got that goal. So that's my closing on that part. Um, what do you think about the subs? Uh, I thought the timing was appropriate. I thought the usage of players, I thought we saw Dino grow up 
and uh, grow up in the sense that you matured a bit as a manager, recognizing guys on yellows and finding the appropriate time to take them off um, with the right substitutions. Uh, you know, I think it's Roman said something to us that's kind of been sticking with me. And I think is kind of also connecting to what we were talking about, what you were talking about right there. Um, as frustrating as this season at times has been for all of us as well, you know, a lot of young guys on this squad and a first time and the ma manager doing his first big gig at like this. And, you know, much to our disappointment or frustrations during this season, there's also the learning as you gain that experience for future times. And I think there's been enough future times this early times this season for Dino to have that moment like this is not going to work if I do that. I need to try this yeah. like what he did on Friday being effective. And I think that's a promising sign. Um, I think the guys that we brought on as the subs, uh, you know, helped and do the job on there. It was great to see Larson back out there. Um, and among others. And I know we had, I know Modenovic didn't come on this game, but he came on in the Stuttgart game, which is, I think that's maybe if there is a highlight to talk about from that game is we're seeing young Nacho Ferry coming on on Friday too. Um, you know, like, one foot forward for the current, one foot forward for the future type thing. So um, it seems like can he keep going? Can Dino keep going in the right direction? We hope so. We'll see what happens on that. But it's a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple last thoughts on this one. The crowd. I mean, they're they're always incredible, but the support that was there uh, through the tough times and the tough times may not be over. We can't take this one win and say the season is saved. Because there is still enough time, as we'll talk about when we get to table talk in a bit. But there is enough time yeah. for things to go sour again. But um, the fans of this club, we say it all the time, they're absolutely incredible. They show up no matter the score, no matter the situation. And I really just feel like they needed this medicine as much as anyone else to say, hey, you know, don't forget, we're still a, we're still a good side. Maybe we're not playing well. Right. Maybe we're not meeting the expectation that's been set. Um, but we got some guys that can play. And I was really pleased to see that because this wasn't a bottom dweller. This wasn't Cologne or one of the other teams fighting to stay alive that, you know, we frankly struggled against this year. This was a side who ha could literally taste the blood in the water of us, you know, hurting ourselves for the last two months here. And I just really felt like that switch was flipped mentally. And I think everybody from the fans, the coaches, the players are finally back on the same page and they know what the expectation is and everyone's ready to work towards it. Hell yeah, man. I am excited. Um, that crowd as fiery as they were, because we, you know, as frustrated as all of us were in the, in our Discord, I'm sure didn't amount to the frustration of those in the stands behind the goal and around there, especially if they've had Augsburg buddies like, um, yelling every obscenity in a book either out loud or in their mind. So for the fact that that second half had to turn around, I'm really happy for all that went fr that were there Friday night. Let's move on to Saturday's match. Uh, Eintracht Frauen 4, FC Nuremberg 1. Um, for reasons I mentioned off the top, I don't have a lot on this. I'm not going to BS you with a bunch of stats and a bunch of here's what I saw because I didn't see a damn thing uh, thanks to the game not being available in the States. Uh, if anyone wants to pool their money with me and buy the broadcast rights for the United States, I'm listening because this is uh, it's a joke at this point where we are in, in the modern game and the women's game drawing more and more attention that I can't see great Bundesliga soccer available here in the States. But anyway, um, the Frauen, uh, <laughs> much like the men's side, they decided to take the hard route and play from behind uh, SC Nuremberg with a corner early in the match. I mean, it, it was a downpour. The, the cameras were hard to see through and everything was drenched. I'm curious, uh, the views that we were able to see on the replay weren't very conclusive, 
but it looked like the corner came in tight. No deflection that, that maybe Stina Johannes was expecting. I think she tried to direct it, but it was too late to get her hands really behind it. And just a tough way to go down less than a minute into the match. Um, but we've seen it before. This group knows how to, how to be patient by their time and then attack and absolutely happened. Um, I think it was Dorson on the, the equalizer. I couldn't tell because there was so much. Rain. Yeah, it was a great yeah. hit. Um, so off another corner for Eintracht, uh, the ball comes out. I want to say around 18 to 20 yards right outside the box. And she just puts her foot into it and lobs it right over the top out of the keeper's reach. Absolutely fantastic. Hit crossbar yeah, and in. Just, you you can't arc it any better than that and and still fit it in the net. I thought it was outstanding. <laughs> and then the it's kind of funny. If you watch the highlights on the, the club's website, it goes from this torrential downpour, absolute shit. And then it's like the 28th minute, it's the next highlights pickup. Clear skies. Not a cloud in the sky, not a drop of rain anywhere to be seen. I had to double check to make sure I was watching the same highlight package. Um, but as she's done all year, Nicole Aniomi, um, just a monster in front of the net, you know, usually right off her foot, but this time picking up a rebound and, and, you know, it's another one of those things when your best goal scorer isn't shooting the ball, she's still having an impact, um, picking up rebounds, taking up space in front, giving other players, uh, room to move inside the box just with the attention she draws. And, uh, it's kind of interesting if you think about where this group would be without her. Um, her emergence later in the season last year uh, has really done wonders for this group. I didn't know who she was. Um, being a little bit newer to this group, I didn't know her history. And um, there's just so much fight in her effort to impact every game, if not – directly with her scoring just to be available. She doesn't mind passing the ball and damn, she is the anchor in absolutely everything that this offense does. So two from her and then a, a Prashnikar icing of the cake at the end. Um, outstanding. Garrett, what do you got? You know, I think um, we talked about the crowd Friday night in the men's match against Augsburg. It needs to be said for the same yes. thing for the crowd that was, in attendance for Frown because for that two and a half minute video, uh, kudos to the club for putting that on there, uh, for us Yanks here. Um, they, whatever the attendance was, it made it sound like it was that much more like a cauldron. Um, and yeah, the weather was fucking weird to be honest with you. I was like, I feel like I've seen that maybe in England before, um, in my times there, but it was like, really really like nasty spring you couldn't see what was going on because in the camera because there was so much rain yeah. um but then they rebounded nicely and i'll tell you what it was um it was an efficient performance and it shows that as frustrated as some of these results leading into this may have been like the men they just the frauen and nico showed that this team does fight because both of Anyomi's goals um you know, and it's just, you know, unfortunately for us, it's a little bit of a sore subject locally here, but I know Brian's in the thick of it right now. It's playoff hockey season here, and Nicole Anyomi's goals were hockey-like in the fact that there were rebounds. She was at the right place at the right time to keep fighting to get a goal ball in the back of the net. Um, that's credit to her. It shows that much, how much of a pain she is for opposing teams to defend. Yeah. And that's something I love to have. Um, and you know, you talked you know talked about Dorson with the you know equalizer. That's a hell of a response, especially when you give up a goal in the first minute like they did to get something like that back within the you know few minutes later. Um, you know they responded well and proud the car with a great strike. I think this is what this team needed. Um, you can kind of let us know what that means now as far as the table race, uh, but I think it's. This team now can finish strong, has the ability to finish strong if they want to. Um, they just got to go and do the work. Yeah. Now. You know, we're going to we're going to talk the men's table later. Uh, the Frauen are off this week, so we're not going to do any uh, any previews for them. So we'll do a little table talk here. There are some interesting matches on the weekend that really affected the Frauen's um, ch 
Champions League potential, which we had all written off after last week. Uh, it seemed like there was absolutely um, no opportunity for us in that one. Hoffenheim had passed us, and they were trending in the right direction. We lost last week, and um, fortunes have changed a little bit in kind of an unexpected way. Um, looking around the table after match day 19, so only three matches left. Eintracht Frankfurt slots back up to third um, because SGS Essen, who – you know, gave us a hell of a run and, and it's just been, you know, pardon the, the reference here to the Detroit Lions, but they've been biting kneecaps on their way up the table and they're taking down. People. Sorry, I had to do it. Uh, they're taking care of people above them and they, they caught Hoffenheim off guard this weekend. So that reversed the two in the table. Hoffenheim dropped to fourth and Eintracht Frankfurt jumps up to third so with three matches left, we're back in play for that qualifying spot uh, that plays through the playoff round. And as, as difficult as it is throwing those extra games in there, we've got the experience on our side with it now. Um, all you got to do is get in. You know, we made it to the group stage by going through qualification last year. If that's what it takes this year, that's fine with me. Um, it's too late to get up to, to Quick second, question that you certainly feel good about our chances for holding on to third. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say there was a new announcement that we had a little bit of discussion about in in our circle today, um, which was the UEFA announcing um, a new competition, a second women's competition, uh, which is knockout based. Looks like it's starting next year. I didn't really, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at what, positions that might be in the Frauen Bundesliga that would benefit in the event that we crash out at third, like we don't sure. wind up in third. Um, I know it's, we've had some differing opinions on the level of discussion of it's like, it's either this or it's either, you know, is it too early for UEFA to have a second women's competition when you look at the game as a whole across the level of teams. But depending if we don't finish in the top three, that is something to maybe, look at as you know first ever competition winner perhaps yeah. and i get that because if there's anyone that wants more it's me um with the frown game at least but I, where i'm at with it i think the gaps between the haves and the haves not in the women's game and the quality between the top of the champions league and the bottom and you can make the fair argument the same about the men's side that some of the smaller countries going in uh, stand absolutely no chance of advancing out of the group stage. Um, but I just think the women's game needs a little bit more time, a little more investment. Um, we need a better distribution of television opportunities. Broadcast rights have to be more well-organized. I would love to see UEFA package the men's and women's rights together and give them the same level of, of visibility. Um, I just think, the sake of throwing another competition out there just to have more teams lower in the table playing just for the sake of playing more games doesn't make sense to me because we're right. adding games. Um, are we restructuring contracts to make sure there's a guarantee payout for these players? Because the women's game, they're not making enough money. If you want them to play three, four or five, six more games in the year, are they being compensated for those? Is there a guaranteed profit margin for the club? Not talking about ours because we're relatively financially stable compared to others. But if you're sending, uh, let's pick another one, Duisburg or SGS Essen on the road, do they have the financial backing to send their women's team across Europe on a campaign for a European competition that's not going to make money? I need more stability right. in it. And that, that's kind of rhetorical, just questions to think about because I didn't do the research. Um, but that's where I hope we can be uh, in the next few years. If they want to institute it, it's fine, but let's make sure that the players are compensated appropriately because there's a risk to their careers. Every time you put them out on the pitch, that's not an exaggeration. Um, we had a, a former Eintracht player who uh, Evan and Dika, whose heart stopped in a match recently and you know, there's no guarantee when you go out there on the pitch. We've seen it a million times with these players. There's no guarantee that you're coming off of that pitch or that your career is going to continue for years after. 
And so if we're adding competition to the women's game, let's make sure that they're being compensated for the risk that goes along with that. And that's my concern in adding another one. We didn't really plan to talk about that, but I think it's a fair take and something that deserves a little bit of, of uh, discussion. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, as it, I always think it could be frustrating right now to see the disparities between the men's and women's game now, but I also think of where, how f- much different it was even not eight, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago compared to now. So we're moving in the right direction, but we're not where we want to be yet as far as that, the game in general on the women's side. Um, so Garrett, I need a break. You need a break. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to put this out there. Um, one of the OGs of the show, Roman, he, uh, he recorded a, I don't know if we're going to call it a Roman rant. He recorded a piece for us. Uh, it didn't make it in last week because we were unavailable. I'll give you the caveat. This was, um, this was recorded at a point of high emotion and it, it may have aged a little differently now that on tracks back on the winning path. Uh, but we hope you return re- that you enjoy the return of Roman, at least now in this brief uh, opportunity and you hear what he has to say. And then we will come up after the break. Hey guys, this is Roman straight from Hamburg to my peeps at the podcast. And first of all, I'm really sorry that I haven't made it to the podcast in recent times, but I have moved back to Germany. I am in Hamburg now. Uh, which is tough enough for a Frankfurt supporter, but there's a cool gang out here. There's also a supporters club. Uh, as always, wherever I am or uh, wherever you are, there is or will be a supporters club for Frankfurt eventually. Anyways, um, this season, man, I was asked uh, for Brian and, and the team just at least, you know, to uh, share a few thoughts on what's happening and I try to do this more regularly now that I've finally moved and I got my office at home and everything. So it should be, should be possible. So anyways, glad you, anyone is interested in what, in my take, but uh, it's a tough season. I don't even know. I have no idea. To be honest with you guys, I have no idea what to make of this season. And I could be ranting on, you know, about situation, how we play, it's gotten really boring to watch Frankfurt. I mean, literally, I I'm not looking forward to matches anymore. In in that way, I mean, I'm I still I still am. To be, but you you know you guys know what I mean. You guys know how you feel. I bet it's all the same. You know, you're excited. You want to watch the game, and then you you see how they kick the ball, and you're like, ah, ah, nothing changed. Um, what to blame? If there is someone to blame. You know, people always say like, yeah, you know, we did this big turnover, you know, we lost Kolomani, we have all these new players and, and, uh, and true, true, uh, got a new coach, true. Uh, but what about seasons before, you know, when we got rid of the, uh, or when the Biffle had, you know, with, when we lost Halea, Jovic, when we had uh, all these other big, you know, when we lost Da Silva, um, when we had big, Big changes. We, we've had big changes all the time. And new coaches from Kovac to Hütte to Glasner. I hate this excuse. Well, I hate excuses in general. You can have excuses, but naming them, that's my problem. And I hate to hear all this over and over again. It's like, oh, these big changes and new situation and this and that. It's like, guys, I don't care. And we, we shouldn't, you know. And... So this, I don't, I don't take an excuse. So what do I accept is we're trying something new, right? We are uh, re, reposing, uh, repositioning our gameplay. Uh, we, we, we are trying these new things, right? We, we want to have more ownership of the ball. We want to be more in control of the game. And yes, this can cause problems. Right, this I totally accept. Right, you cannot you cannot change a style, a type of play, from day one to day two, or within a few weeks, or maybe maybe even without a few within a few months. This I don't know. I, I can't. T- I'm not a pro. Right, so the the officials must must know all of this. This is an excuse I understand, and give give that's all I want to focus on. You know, tell me the players are not ready yet. Tell me the gameplay is not ready yet. This is what I want to hear. I don't want to hear any stupid sh- shite about. 
you know, about new players, about new coach, about new, 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 new. This, I don't fucking care, right? This is, this is not, this is a lame, this is the lame, most lame excuse ever out there, you know? Tell me about the players are not ready yet. Or you, we don't have the players for what we want to want to do. Maybe we need three, four steps. Of course, we cannot change every everything at once. So maybe there has to be uh, a few levels uh, in order to make this change happen, right? This is what I want to hear. This is what I want to hear from the officials. The officials got to tell me where are we in our uh, in our plan to to uh, to fulfill the the next step to fulfill the the change that we want to have. This is what I want to hear from the coach, and and nothing else. Or maybe you know the players didn't work out that we bought. I mean, what is this with with Van de Beek? Like, why is he not playing? I mean, of course, Kalajic was just super annoying. Nobody can do anything. Else. But still, tell me. And and I'm sorry. I mean, I love Timothy Chandler, but why if why I just don't. Anyways, stop. I, I got I got him. Okay, so I, it, it, as a start, it should be more of an overall than like a game uh, discussion about about the Stuttgart game because like we had no chance against Stuttgart. Yes, we played well at the end, you know, and yes, we had we were let's say about to score or we were maybe closer to score than Stuttgart in the in the last round, uh, in the in the last twenty thirty minutes. But why Stuttgart didn't need to? I mean, they already had three. Why they, they could let us try. And and this is what, what annoys me. Like we try and we fail. We don't make it. We don't get there. We don't get uh, uh in the box dangerously. You know, we don't get we, we we don't cause any any in any trouble, right? And this is what I'm missing, right? Anyways, uh I don't want to do this monologue too long. So all in all to summarize what I've been saying now is Don't give me lame excuses. Give me real excuses. Give me reasons. No excuses. Give me reasons. That's what I want to hear. Then of all, talking about Top Miller, guys, you know, I mean, I've had my times and where I'm like, why are we doing this? Why are we not seeing any progress? Why is the coach ready to do to do this? And to be honest, I don't know. I don't want to be the one who's who's uh, who's who, who, who thinks it's his fault. I mean, obviously, it's partially is it is his fault. But you know, let's say in the, in the grand scheme of things, maybe that's what we need. It's just, maybe we have to take two steps back to move one step forward. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Not me to call. So I'm I'm biased here. So in in Germany, right? Is is Frankfurt the home of Goethe? Uh, You know, we have like zwei Seelen wohnen ach in meiner Post, right? So there are two souls living in my chest. I should look up that translation. It's going to be important. Anyways, it's a famous quote. So there are two souls in my chest. And one is, uh, okay, Tom Miller was a fail. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't make it on time. Uh, he didn't, he, he didn't uh, fulfill what he was, uh, what he was there to do. Uh, and put it this way: If they would, if they would get rid of um, um, uh, Top Miller, I would not be, I would not be mad. You know, I would understand. I was like, okay, well. And the other, the other part of, of me in me is, okay. Uh, the Gresha or and all the other pros that uh, that have anything to say, the officials, so to say, they know their shit better than I. I do totally right. Who am I? <clears throat> right, I'm just a. Simple supporter. Anyway, so my, my, my thing is maybe I'm missing something or I hope I'm missing something and the others see that. And if that is the case, if they still see this, then please let's move forward. You know, let's not complain. But then I want these reasons. I want to know why we are we are we are lagging behind in our plan. Anyway, so I'm I'm fine with going for another season with Top Miller, you know. Um I I personally still think it's maybe it was a little bit too early for him with us. I think he's going to be a great coach. Um, but, you know, I think what he needs to do, and this would be my recommendation is if anyone is listening, who you know, he should uh, think what went wrong. Like I said, I'll put it this way. If he would, if he would be fired tomorrow, He would sit there and he would think about, okay, what did I do wrong? What do I need to, and, you know, what did I do wrong? What may have caused this? What were like the underlying issues that I didn't see that weren't there for me? You know, he, he would do all of this. And when whenever he, he would start a new position, 
he would think, oh my God, so this is what I did wrong. This is where, where I wasn't good enough. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this better in, in the next job, in, in, the, in the coming job, let's say, hypothetically. And this is what he needs to do without getting fired. Right? He needs to think about if you get fired, what did he do wrong? And then he's got to start next season with what am I going to do better now? What am I going to, uh, um, how do I improve myself? Right. This is the second season under Top Miller should be his second job, you know, kind of like starting completely over. And I mean, of course, you can't tell this to the team. And, you know, it's just that internally you have, you have to think, like, OK, I did this wrong in the team. Anyways, that's kind of like what I'm hoping for. And yeah, it's already 10 minutes. And as you can, guys can think, I could talk forever, but I'm going to keep this a little bit shorter and maybe more often. And then I, I can do this in, in shorter time. Anyways. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, keep it up. You know we're still Frankfurt, and you know the good the good thing of the soul hole is like we're getting rid of all these success fans. You know those celebrity supporters. You know those that were just supporters because you know Frankfurt we are cool and hip and awesome in town. You know now we're not, and goodbye to y'all who who who's uh, who needs this uh, to be a Frankfurt supporter, and all the other ones I, we've suffered more. This is just you know. Moving forward, guys, awesome. Uh, let's finish up the season somehow. And all the best to you guys. Uh, mic drop. <laughs> bye bye. Ciao. Welcome back, segment two. Hey, I'm Track Frankfurt. Uh, Chris and Garrett here in the Detroit area for the night, at least. Um, Garrett, we love hearing from Roman. I love hearing from Roman. Uh, we still talk to him on the side, but it's great to hear his voice here again. Um, we went a little bit out of order. I got to talk about what we're drinking because I had I had a good one today that I, I need to bring up. But um you and I had a great dinner yesterday. Nice time out. Paint Creek Tavern, yep. uh, Rochester, Michigan. Uh, GM is a good friend of ours. Uh, if you're in the Detroit area for the drafts this week for the NFL or you're in the Detroit area, check out Paint Creek Tavern. Good place to watch a game or have a great beverage and, and good food. Uh, what's been on your menu lately? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's um, it was funny today. I've had a you know pleasure of having a couple of good meals. Um, the, over the last couple of weeks in absence, the Wendy's app has been throwing hella good <laughs> deals. Um, if those that were wondering, what are you talking about? There's always been good deals. March Madness had dollar singles and $2 doubles. So yeah, um, that's all a man needs to hear. I hate that. that you're but, so skinny. Uh, I hate it. <laughs> what, you, I do squats every day, man. Um, I agree with you yesterday. Uh, shout out to our friend Ken and the fine staff at Pink Creek Tavern. Um, you know, edge downtown, just at the edge of the craziness. Um, great food, uh, great comp, great food on there. That chili um, you had yesterday. Any, my God, that looked good. Venison, venison chili. Um, really, really good. Um, for anyone that's in the area this weekend that are wondering how, like, why do we talk so much about Detroit City? We'll be there for Detroit City Pittsburgh Riverhounds seven o'clock Eastern next this coming Saturday. Um, if not, come another time. It's always usually open. Uh, what were you having yesterday, though? Um, I know you were trying to. I think you had a couple different. Options, yeah, a good, I believe. Maybe. Yesterday, I had a good fried perch sandwich, and I was kind of eyeing that because yep. that's one of my favorite things they do. Some good lake perch is always awesome. But I was like trying to think about the right beer to pair with that because I knew that's what was coming in. I was like, it's got to be something weedy. So I went with um, the original Michigan beer of summer, the Oberon, which was outstanding uh, from Bell's Brewery over in Kalamazoo. But today uh, I was killing some time and I ended up at Atwater in the park over in Gross Point. Uh, the kind of one of their branches of uh, Atwater Brewery that's over in Rivertown. And I had, you know, their, um, their, their uh, Atwater Dirty Blonde, which is just a classic go-to lighter beer, nice blonde. 
Um, but they had a peach version. A nice vip yeah, beer. Yeah, really good. Um, but they had a peach version. And the, the bartender was like, well, if you Yo. like the peach, we also have a strawberry. And if you like the strawberry, we also have a tropical. I'm like, my God, what is, I, I actually have to, you know, drive after this. And she's like, well, how about you just sample these and pick your favorite? So I went with the peach. The peach was outstanding. Um, like if, if you like the Atwater Dirty Blonde, the peach literally tastes like summer. It was outstanding. So uh, the drinks are flowing. We're going to have quite, I'm going to have quite a few more uh, with the NFL draft in town this week, which has consumed my life. Uh, it's the pinnacle of my career in sports security right now. And I'm looking forward to ending my job, my current role uh, with this NFL draft process and moving on to bigger and better things. Uh, but so is this podcast. We're moving to something bigger and better. And that is table talk. Garrett, let's talk about the weird situation that is the Bundesliga. Before we talk about coefficients, because you and I had to do a little bit of Googling and research to figure this out. Let's just talk about where the table stands as of right now in its current structure. Uh, Leverkusen tied up the lead. So- um, they they put the bow on it. They're the champions and well-deserved. Uh, it through, I mean, this happened the week prior, but uh, it's been a while since, I mean, obviously since anyone other than Bayern won it, but even when Bayern was winning, very rarely during their decade of dominance was – it tied up this early. Um, what Alonzo has done over there, the group they've assembled, just how efficient they play. And they did it again this weekend, didn't they? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I want to, as much as we joke diehards in Bundesliga or clubs like us, joke about maybe like the Wolfsburgs, Hoffenheims, Leverkusens because of how those clubs were formed. It doesn't that gets thrown out the window when you see what it means to the people that were in that stadium in Leverkusen uh, two Sundays ago when they wrapped it up in convincing fashion too. Um, Like I'm ready to go at any given moment. And when Florian, I was at the goal that Verts made at three nil or four nil. And you have people starting to run out. You celebrate and Virch just does a little like set, like settle down, run back, and everyone's like, "Hey guys, not yet, not yet." Like they all knew they were ready to go. Um, yeah, it's and I I'm trying to think when the last time it may be fifteen at ten fifteen ish years, even when Byron's run where this league was wrapped up the way it was so quickly, um, a Leverkusen team that and this is still wild to say at the end of April going on May still undefeated. In all competitive matchups, just when you think they're about to lose to like Carabag in Europa League, or lose a tie that they already ra- a game in a tie of West Ham that they already wrapped up, or even Dortmund on Sunday, they find a way to at least get a point. Yeah, and if that's that's like I said, Chabi Alonso, we saw that Leverkusen side where they were they were at when he took over in October of 2022. Look where they're at 18 months later is mind blowing. And the fact he's wanting to stay there to not be a one and done, I'll give him credit. Um, it's, you know, fun to see on there. Stuttgart as well, even though they kicked our ass last week, um, what they're doing this year. Um, even like other teams like Augsburg and that, um, yeah, I think it's good. It's refreshing to see this. Somebody other than Bayern. Um, even though we got to talk about this weird situation we're about to have. Yeah, we will. Um, but another point about Leverkusen, what they've done is they built it the right way. They did not go out and exceed anything uh, from a from a smart business perspective they didn't sign players that don't make sense they sign guys that fit a system that works to win their matches uh in the competitions they're in and the key to that is to win the competitions that they are in they didn't extend themselves too far they had a goal and that's win the year and that's literally what they're going to do potentially is win out the entire year which we saw that from the the barcelona women's side uh recently 
but the the parody in the Bundesliga. Like you just drop them from time to time. You know, we, your five one Bayern loss to Eintracht makes a little more sense now when you see that they haven't been what they usually are. But it, those kinds of games just happen. Everyone has an off day. But even on Leverkusen's off day, they are figuring things out. Uh, this past weekend, they did it again in just astonishing fashion um, against Dortmund. Dortmund scores in the 81st minute. You're like, oh, surely this is it. There's, you know, Leverkusen's got that championship hanger, hangover. There's no way they're coming back. 90 plus 7. 90 plus 7. 90 plus 8. eight. My bad. 90 plus 8. Whatever. 90 plus way too many minutes on the board. <laughs> that just, right. That's the kind of situation where you're like, you know what? This is just meant to be. And um, if anyone's going to have a meant to be moment, I'd rather have it be anyone other than Byron at this point. Uh, so that's enough of the Leverkusen talk. This isn't their podcast. Screw them every day going forward. Uh, but for now, you know, props to them for doing it the right way. But around the rest of the Bundesliga, uh, right. Byron sitting at second. Stuttgart still third. Everybody in December said, hey, they're going to fall off at some point. They're, they haven't. They lost on the weekend, but they still won three of their last five. They're still chugging ahead. Uh, they're still four point four points clear of Leipzig. In that four spot, followed by Dortmund in fifth and Frankfurt in sixth. Now we we'll talk more about bottom of the table stuff another time. But right now, Garrett, we got to talk about the C word. That's confusion in my mind. Um, but coefficient. There's a lot of talk in our Discord chat, a lot of talk on Twitter about what the hell is this coefficient? Why does it matter? And you and I did some research before this to actually try to figure out what it means. So basically the coefficient is a numerical formula to determine what leagues are trending stronger or weaker in Europe and how to allocate European competition slots for Champions League, Europa League, Conference League. And that coefficient is a sliding number based on a variety of factors. But the biggest one is wins and losses in in international competition, right? So... Bayern and Dortmund both make it to the Champions League semifinal. The Bundesliga is in a good position to pick up a fifth Champions League slot. Is that correct? Am I correct so far? They are in the top two. Uh, they are second uh, behind Italy. Um, you know, but Italy has a lot of teams in the Europa League and um, maybe one in the Conference League, but. The top two uh, countries in that coefficient scale get an additional Champions League slot with the new format that's starting next season. Okay. So there's the potential there for a fifth Bundesliga champion, Champions League spot. And the reason that that matters is because that would slide what is the, usually the fifth position in the Bundesliga goes to the Europa League. Well, that would slide to six, which is, as you know, right now, and it has been for – the damn majority of the season, nine track Frankfurt. So six could finish with the Europa League, but there's a caveat on that. If Bayern Dortmund finishes fifth or lower and they win the Champions League, then the Champions League slot would slide down to six because they would be automatic qualifiers um, based on winning the previous year's competition. So the opportunity exists still for Eintracht Frankfurt to qualify for a Champions League position. I'm not going out to put on my Charlie Brown black and yellow. Not going to do it. Would I consider eating an extra banana or, you know, supporting something a little more black and yellow along the way? Maybe a little bit. Um, I don't know. I drink more cans of mellow yellow. There's the black and <laughs> you yellow know, right I, there. I have a hard time. I, I want to prop the Bundesliga up as much as I can. I want our teams to be successful because I do believe when the league is stronger, it makes all the teams in the league more respectable and stronger themselves. It brings in more money and all these kinds of things. It's just hard <laughs> because the ones that are in this competition right now, I don't 
I won't cheer for Bayern. It's just I'd rather lose a Champions League spot than pull for them. Dortmund, a little less on the disgusting side, but um, if it gets us into the Champions League, we talked about this off air. If it gets us into the qualifier, I don't want to get in to get embarrassed. It might sound dumb. It might sound weak, like, oh, you don't want to go to Champions League. No, I don't want to be embarrassed. I would rather go to Europa League and play well with a group that, you know, is actually put together in advance of the season instead of when the season's five, six weeks old, um, transferring guys in and out. I would rather go in with an organized plan to the Europa League than get trounced in the Champions League. Am I way off base with that take? No, because if we have to assume that this current squad, how much turnover can this squad effectively do to be ready to go up to not just the Bundesliga and then a, a much better performance in the Pokal than what we experienced this year? Shout out to Saarbrook, and they had a hell of a run in the Pokal, by the way. Um, we ha- we'd be going up two levels in European competition from where we were this year. Um, we would need to get deeper in terms of numbers. We would need to probably, I don't want to say do what Union Berlin this, did this year because that really ruined them as far as the chemistry. Uh, but it would be a lot of what we did two seasons ago. Uh, the beginning By that, I mean end of 22 into the beginning of the 22-23 season. Um, do I feel like we, I need to see how we do these last four matches to like give me an idea of what direction are we going to be heading in to next season, if that's a fair thing to say. Uh, because, you know, the final four isn't exactly a easy thing. Bayern away, Leverkusen at home, uh, Munchen Gladbach away, and Leipzig at home. That's a gauntlet. I think that's a good four matches to, I think that's a very good four matches to, if not for the results, how do we look in those matches? Yeah. Um, and to give you an idea real quick of how feasible it is for Dortmund in the champ in this Champions League, um, there are for those that are wondering that haven't been paying as much attention, there are no Premier League teams. Um, so all the fancy money in the world gets you shit this year. Um on one end you have Bayern Munich taking on Real Madrid. Um, and on the other one you have Borussia Dortmund taking on PSG. Uh, who have already played each other twice because they were in the same group in the group stage. Isn't this about um, the time of year where PSG see, usually fizzles out? Well, they also have added to that they have extra divas this year in one round of Cole Milani. So I'm thinking maybe Dortmund gets to the final. Maybe he could help us out from the inside. <laughs> how do you beca- how do you be- get rid of the persona non grata status? You realize you fucked up and you helped this team get into the Champions League. Yeah, that would endear him to everybody if he just kind of missed a shot or something. (laughs) I don't know. You know, it it, it comes across like like I'm afraid to go back to Champions League. I'm not. I think that we built our our last several years of stable European play by being prepared for the competitions we were in and being up for the task. Right. And certainly we could sign appropriate people to compete in Champions League and we can figure it out. I I think we figured out we can get out of a group stage while being a little shorthanded relative to others. But also I believe in growing and I think we're such a young group um that you know the experience of playing Conference League this year, I think Europa League would be appropriate in a step in the right direction for us next year. Um, I wouldn't say no to champions league just strictly because of the money, but I caution, we, we we probably shouldn't even get this excited about it after you listed the schedule off. Uh, But I caution anyone that, that thinks it would just be owed to us because we certainly haven't done anything to help our chances in qualifying. To give you an idea, Chris, of how important, so Dortmund cannot finish higher. They cannot finish higher than fifth for this th- scenario to work in our favor, provided they, you know, lift the Champions League. So um, we need this coming weekend, 
well, yeah, well, we need Stuttgart to be in third, and we need the fucking sugar energy drinks to stay in fourth. Well, um, we have the ability to help them, and that, that, but that would also hurt us. Yeah. Um, and also, this coming Saturday is Leipzig Dortmund at 9.30, three days before the first leg of Dortmund PSG. <laughs> yeah, man, shit's getting yeah. wild. So when we you know, sit back and say, oh, we're out of all competitions. It doesn't really matter. It really does affect us in a very, very big way. Um, it's certainly going to come down to the wire. Um, but in coming down to the wire, so is this podcast. So we got to talk previews. That was a pretty good segue. I'm never good at segues, but that one worked well. Hit that one out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This Saturday, 930 in the morning here in Detroit. It's 1530, the traditional Saturday slot. Over in Germany, um, if you're watching in Ireland with Eddie at a pub, I have no idea what time it's going to be there. I'm sorry. I failed you. 2.30. You 2.30. Um, so let's talk Bayern Munich, Eintracht Frankfurt. Garrett, what happened last time these two got together? Oh, uh, something magical called Eintracht Frankfurt 5, Bayern Munich 1 for the second time that we've had a watch party at Detroit City Club. Yeah, um, it, that's kind of... We should turn that into like the USA Mexico Dos Acero. Just get that FC Bayern Eintracht Frankfurt 5 1 situation going on. Um, but <laughs> here's the thing this one's a little different. It's on the road. We have not played well at Allianz uh, traditionally, except recently. Uh, we got our first win. That was our first ever win there, right? First win in Munich in 20-something years. Crazy. Definitely our first win at Allianz, October of 21. Absolutely crazy. Um, so we got a little recent history there, but at the same time, it's a tough place to play. At the same time as that, they don't have a lot to play for. Their, their bigger matchup is Champions League midweek, and they're going to be far more interested in what's going on there than what's going on at their home pitch this weekend. So maybe we can catch them off guard a little bit. Um, maybe we're going to be a little healthier, having played fewer competitive matches recently. What What are you looking for? Um, I want to see good intent as much as possible. Um, you're playing a Bayern side. Unless Bayern does massively heavy rotation, they're going to want to control the game. Um, if not like dragging possession, just pushing, stretching players, teams out, you know, run, you know, run people running different runs in there, opening Kane up, opening Sané up. Uh, but you know, if it's anything rewarding is that Eintracht Frankfurt's gotten results the last two times they've been to Munich a win in October 21, a draw in January of 23. Um, you're right about this Bayern team not having much to play for in the league, especially when you account the fact that, you know, they're going to be without Thomas Tuchel at the end of the year. Um, they want Champions League. Um, they want to prove people like me wrong about the Harry Kane curse. Uh, that's a talk for another time. Uh, but I think... I think this is a good time. To, this is a good time more than ever right now to go to Bayern and at least try to get a point. So Yeah. You know... It, I mentioned the the first victory in in Munich and forever earlier, um, but over the last five matches, two wins to each side and three draws. Or I'm sorry, uh, in the last five matches, two wins and one draw. But like we we don't we don't play down against top teams. We generally play up, and we're going to be playing up against a team that's certainly better than us but it certainly has their eyes on a far different prize. And if there was still an opportunity to extend that Bundesliga uh, title streak, then I certainly would give them the edge here. But I think we have the opportunity to pop up there uh, and, and bite them. They're a little bit beat up. Um, we don't have any suspensions for this one, do we? I didn't actually look, but. Is two to, is two to back or is he still out? Uh, this might be his third. It was three games, right? I, that could be a concern. Um, Knauf, did he get? No, I don't think he got his suspension. Um, but anyway, I, I really well, failed in uh, my research. But but I also think we'll be in a. I honestly think we'll do the back four shape more than the back yeah. three, which means oh, yeah, for sure. 
you would have Pacho Cop probably in the center, and then you just have to decide who your fullbacks and your winners are going to yeah. be there. Um, Marmouche still has 17 goals in 25 games. We're scoring goals up front a little better, at least this past weekend. And, you know, we've had luck in the past. I don't know if we have quite the speed for it, um, but we've had luck in the past against Byron going over the top. And if we can get a guy like Ekatike out there uh, with one or two creative touches and, you know, spring somebody loose, who knows what can happen. Um, I think this is going to be a lot right. closer than – the betting lines and the, the so-called experts are saying, Garrett, what's your prediction? Um, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say we're going to win in Munich. I don't feel co- that confident in one us and two Bayern to completely capsize in league play, um, especially when they play Stuttgart next week to basically wrap up who's going to be second. Um, but you're talking about that speed and the over-the-top Dina and Bembe had a master game the last time we played them in December. I think he had two goals. You could put Mbembe on the right side. You can put Knopf on the right side. If Because I'm thinking I would not be surprised if we did a 4-4-2, 4-3-3 type shape um, with the winners. Chai be more out left because I think Marmush and Ekatike have shown to be a good, you know, tall, tall not as tall pairing. I'll go 1-1 one, one because... I think Harry Kane finds a way to get a goal because he always seems to find a goal now. Uh, but I can I feel good about us getting at least a point there. Um, and I feel like I want to say Akatike gets another one. That's I think our goal. I mean, but I think it'll be I, I'm feeling good about one. Okay, one. I'm with you on the draw, uh, but I think it's going to be two to two, um, and I think we're going to get up early. I think we get an early one. Uh, the carryover from the last match will be in our favor. Maybe a little hangover, tired legs on on the Byron side. They've been playing a lot of football. So maybe the opportunity exists to get one on them early. Then they settle in. Uh, but I think 2-2 is most likely. I, I'm going to go with Akatike, but I'm also going to go. You can't go a full season without a goal from a corner, right? Like you can't. It's just. You call doesn't him, happen. You're calling the. You're saying it ends I'm on saying Saturday. It ends Saturday. Uh, hell, give me, give me Tuta with with one off a corner. I don't know. Just it, put the ball in the mixing bowl. See what happens. Because, I mean, it's just mad. You, we're if, if Tuta's not in, then that, then what? Robin Coke then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the guys from the back line coming up for a corner. Uh, he's got one there. All right. Um, no, he doesn't have one from there because we don't have any. But he, he's got one with his head, maybe from open play. So, yeah, I like our opportunity to take points in Munich. So do you. And uh, because of that, we'll be talking about a loss next week. <laughs> That's the way it usually seems <laughs> to go. Only tradition, right? Oh, God. Uh, Garrett, where are we going to find you on the social media map? Uh, all right. You can find me Twitter, Instagram, Discord, at GM Comats. Um also, um, I tracked Frank for Detroit at Detroit SKA on Twitter. Um, not sure if we're going to get one more watch party in uh, before seasons end. But in light of the news that t- was announced for this summer, stay tuned because um, there might be some good, cool developments on there. If you're in the Detroit area, um, you know, also check out um, doing some more stuff with the majors Detroit and the Detroit city sports cast, which covers all the sports teams in the city. Um, so, you know, it's uh, good times. And of course, channel 451 for us, Detroit city set goes. Cool, cool. And you can follow me at C in the D three, one, three, Twitter, Instagram, Peloton, discord, all the usuals. Uh, and you can follow the show. Of course, halfpod.com. All of our links are on there. Cause I always forget them. Um, on X at H E F pod. And of course the discord chat 24, 365. My phone's been blowing up there. I got to see what's going on. Probably um, talking about how excited we are about the last weekend and how excited we are for the upcoming weekend. Uh, so that's it for this episode of Hey on track Frankfurt. We look forward to talking to you next week after points in Munich. Cheers. But they had a peach version. Yeah, man. Shit's getting wild. But they had a peach version. Hey, I'm
Fuck, 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 fuck